It was a Volkswagen Bug, 71 Bug. Um, it had rained the night before, and we were driving up the street, and the music was blaring, and the ground was slick, and some kid, 14-year-old kid, came out in front of my car, and I ran into that kid, and he went into the windshield, and the windshield shattered. So my name is Pej Manalagamanan. I go by Pej. Um, I've been sober almost 13 years. June 16, 2007 will be my sobriety birthday, so I'll be 13. And my drug of choice was what you got, whatever you have. But, um, you know, I've tried all kinds of drugs throughout my life. I was addicted to many of them, um, heroin, opium, um, but methamphetamine brought me to my knees. It was my demise. Smoked marijuana for a long time. I huffed gas. I did a lot of designer drugs, a lot of ecstasy, a lot of uh, club drugs and things like that. Um, crack, got addicted to crack for a long time too. And so, you know, poly substance abuser, I did all kinds of drugs. I mixed drugs together. I drank a lot, a lot of alcohol because um, I felt like the alcohol and drugs together would enhance each other. They complemented each other. I could go a lot longer, a lot harder, depending on what I was using. If I used stimulants with depressants, um, I could get the real effect uh, that I thought I, that was being produced through a, through a depressant like alcohol. What I enjoyed about methamphetamine was... Um, I was a go-getter and I wanted to get things done and it, I felt like, like, have you ever seen that movie Limitless, like where you just, where you, there's so much that you can do in such a short amount of time. So like when I did meth, I felt like I could be highly productive, I could get a lot more done. I would start all these projects and I would just pile them up and have them all going and I'd work on this one for a little bit and I had ADD really bad so like I'd go from this one to that one, from that one to this one, that one to that one, but they were always unfinished projects. But still like in my mind I felt like I'm going to accomplish, I'm going to do this and that. I'll build a robot out of all these pieces of metal in my garage, you know, so like I really, really thought that I could be more productive. I was going to school for a short amount of time too. Um, it was an art school and like I had all of these projects so like I thought if I do more meth I could stay up later and get more stuff done in my art uh, respective art field but you know I would overkill in the end so uh, as much as I thought that it was something that I really enjoyed and I loved um, I really hated it because it was bringing me down. I was uh, carefree, happy-go-lucky, driven, um, ambitious. My mother taught me to be artistic because she was artistic. So I definitely liked to draw. I loved um, swimming. I loved playing sports, basketball, baseball, football, all those things. Unfortunately, I grew up in a part of America where, I mean, fortunately or unfortunately, I, I definitely got a good education as a kid growing up where I was growing up, but I was brown and I was Iranian, I was Persian. I felt like um, I didn't fit in a lot of times because I didn't have um, the same skin color as my peers. I didn't uh, have the same religion as them. I grew up in the same neighborhoods as them. I felt like sometimes that they dress better than me or have better clothes than me or like their parents gave them more than me. So I felt neglected in that sense, but that's only because um, I was part of the material. Like I wanted the material stuff. Um, I started to be drawn to, you know, I would watch these certain movies and see, you know, kids that were like the ones that were messing around and that it became something that looked a little more attractive for me to go after was to do go against the grain and start doing things that aren't good for me. First time I ever started using was, you know, there was a, a, a period of time, like obviously my dad would give me little sips of cognac and beer off of his drinks, right? That was in, in very young ages. And that's just because we were in a party setting with all of the adults and he thought that it looked cute for the, the young little boy to have a sip of beer or a sip of cognac, even cognac, yeah. That's my first drink was cognac. But I remember mowing lawns in Salt Lake City, Utah in the summertime for my uncle and I would go and retreat back to a shed in my alone time at the end of a long day when it was hot and take the gasoline and sit on the ground and sniff it. Like, I don't even know where I got the idea to sniff it, but I did. And after you would sniff enough of it, it would give me this euphoric feeling. I believe that my first using, like heavy using, to get out of right here right now was during that year, 12 years old, between huffing, weed, and alcohol. Well, hmm. When I was uh, 17 years old, I had just gotten a driver's license and I was already doing a lot of partying. And one morning when I was hungover from the night before partying, 
Uh, I had piled all my friends into my car. It was a Volkswagen Bug, 71 Bug. Um, it had rained the night before, and we were driving up the street, and the music was blaring, and the ground was slick, and some kid, 14-year-old kid, came out in front of my car, and I ran into that kid, and he went into the windshield, and the windshield shattered, and the car kept rolling, and his body was flung over the top of his uh, minivan, and he landed head first into the ground, and he didn't die right then, but he died four days later because his mom took him off of life support. So that's one experience. But I do want to say that um, there's countless things that happened throughout the time I was using. But there was one particular night when I was 18 years old. And I was uh, driving in, um, at that time it was called El Toro, California. They don't call it that anymore. It's now Lake Forest. But I was on my way to go get drugs. And I already had some drugs in a car and a gun. And the gun was used in a drive-by by some gangsters. And I don't know why I was holding it for them, but it was in the trunk of my car. Um, and it had its, uh, the numbers shaved off. And then in the back seat of the car, I had a whole bunch of um, cocaine, uh, marijuana. And I saw a cop was tailing me and he was following me. And the lights came on. I said, I knew it. He's pulling me over. He came up to the car and he's like, hey, how you doing? I'm like, Oh, uh, I'm all right. And he just said, okay, do you know why I pulled you over? And I said, no, I would love to know. And he said, because your seatbelt is tucked underneath your arm. You have to have it over your over your chest. And I said, okay, well, I'll fix it. And he goes, okay, do me a favor. Tell me something. Do you have any weapons or alcohol or drugs in the car? And I'm thinking, in the moment, I thought, all of the above. Right? Like, I'm really screwed. Like, this guy's going to search this car right now and find it all, right? So the dude gets in the car and starts searching the car. All throughout the front seat, you know, he's doing a nice thorough search. And he has me stand over to the side and his partner's across on the other side, just shining the light in my eyes. I was kind of surprised that they didn't like point, put me in the corner. He just had me stand aside. He's going through the car. And all of a sudden the dude is just shining the light in my eyes. He's like, what's your name? And I go, well, I'm Pej. Pej what? And I said, I said my full name, Pej Manalagamanan. He said, do you remember me? And I said, who are you? I can't see you because you have the light in my eyes. And he put the light down. He goes, well, I'm Noel. I was in your algebra class in high school. He goes, I'm on a ride along. He goes, Jim, it's okay. I know him. And Jim, instead of putting his hands back there, got out of the car, came out, and they said, make sure you wear your seatbelt right and let me go. And I went right up the hill and right to the dealer's house and went and got more drugs. At what point or moment did I made me stop using or at least realize to stop using i'll say this right now so in the last seven months of me using my mom already had to come to jesus with me she had me sit down in her and she actually met with me in south coast plaza at a corner bakery we sat down and she looked me in the eyes and told me um she knows that i've been getting high in her house and um she had found stuff in the house that I was hiding, and I denied it and said that that's old stuff. It's not. It doesn't belong to me. She she wasn't having it. I went homeless in my car for up to seven months, and I still was actively using. One night I went to go get drugs, and um, uh, it was the eight ball of meth, and it was for me and another girl. I had put it underneath the car with a magnet, and. The magnet was like a weak magnet. And so I got on the 55 freeway to go two freeway exits up and um, the drugs fell off the bottom of the car. I went back on the freeway and I started, I pulled the car off to the side of the freeway and I was walking up and down the freeway, scouring the side of the freeway, just thinking, where is it? Like, where is it? Where are these drugs? And I had this moment of clarity right then where I thought, What's happened to your life? Like, why are you, it's really, bro? And um, so that was one indicator that something needs to change. Okay, what type of treat, treatment helped me recover? So <clears throat> interestingly enough, the type of treatment that helped me recover was I went to a recovery home that wasn't a licensed residential treatment facility, but pretended to be and acted like it was. I mean, the guy that ran it was, he was like a little Persian Yoda recovery guy. That's like what, what I needed. I needed a person that was like a recovery mogul. And that's kind of what he was in our community. Like he was just the type of guy that, uh, I had met him five years before, so I knew the guy was all about recovery. I walked in and that man just broke me down 
and built me up. And he was direct, assertive. If you leave your chair out, he'd come over and be like, bro, this is the third time you left your chair out. Like the chair's not gonna put itself away. So he was very, very direct and hard on us. And you'd write words. Like if you really came short a lot, like I got to about 8,000 words and I was like, okay, I know what to do around here. Right, I'm in my mid thirties, like I'm a man. I'm gonna start acting like a man. I see what this guy is doing. Those people in that house that had hundreds of thousands of words. And like the sober livings I have, they're highly structured and we, we, we follow that model. So like we feel like we can help people just as much as a treatment center would because you know we, we just make sure people do their chores, they don't leave stuff in the sink, that they're on top of their A game and that they have sponsors. And that man insisted in our sessions during case management that I have to have a sponsor. If I came short and didn't get a sponsor because I wasn't about about it, then he would be like, if you don't have a sponsor by next week, you get 2,000 words. And if I questioned and said 2,000 words, he'd say, you want 4,000? I'd say, no, I'll take the 2,000, right? I don't even want to call it pride or proud, but uh, this is what I'm happy about, what I'm content with, is the fact that a person like me that was uh, dying um, of a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body that was often waking up um, in embankments because I've been up for too long and I would just, uh, I'd either be in a gutter or on the side of the street. Sometimes my mother would come out to the front of the house and find me with one leg dangling out of the car and one on the inside and me just laying there with drool coming down my face because I hadn't slept in a week and I couldn't even make it in the house. She'd come and wake me up and say, son, get up and come in the house. I don't want the neighbors to see you like this, like 5.30 in the morning. Well, that same house that she changed the locks on and wouldn't allow me in, this is sober living now. You know, it's a sober living where I hope that the guys that I have in there are staying sober, right? The most rewarding thing is when I see somebody get the lights come on in their eyes and they really are about this thing too. So what advice would I give to somebody who's struggling with meth, heroin, any type of drug, um, is that there's hope. Um, you have to ask yourself that sometimes when you're deep in your addiction, you know you want out. You know you want to get out of this. Like you know life wasn't supposed to be like this. I'm sure the thought crosses your mind where you think, what does my life become? Because the thought went through my mind a lot of times. And one of the biggest uh, hangups that I ever had in my life and the biggest fears in my life was to raise my hands and say, please help me. And um, I, I would never ask for help. I had too much fa a false sense of pride and ego that would just uh, not allow me to ask for help. And it's okay to ask for help. If you need help, just uh, seek us out because that's what all I needed to do was to have the right people in my path for me to actually ask for the help. And it was the best thing I could do for myself. When you actually truly ask for help, uh, ask and you shall receive, it will be there.